the GABA receptor is the most important targeted receptor for quinazoline hypnotic sedatives. The discovery of this class of sedatives was by coincidence. Since the 1800s, chemists have been designing and extracting new compounds to combat diseases, like malaria, then a nearly exclusively fatal disease. In the late 1940s, a potential anti-malaria agent was extracted from a traditional Chinese herb mixture, prepared to fight off infection. The chemical in question was Fabifugin, which features a 4-3H quinazolinone core. But how did they discover the structure? Chemists of that time had no access to modern identification techniques like NMR or spectroscopy. As a matter of fact, structural determination techniques in the first half of the 20th century merely relied on degradation reactions that would reduce the target molecule to smaller bits. Chemists would continue to degrade the molecule until one of the degraded products matched with a compound known to their chemical library. With some calculations and matching, you could then eventually determine what the parent molecule looked like. Continuing, the identification of this core piqued the interest of many medicinal chemists and set the stage for the development of analogs. So in 1950, scientists Kacker and Zahir developed an array of analogs which were tested on mice infected with malaria. However, to the researcher's surprise, one particular derivative stood out, bringing the tested mice to sleep, similar to the then-known sedatives called barbiturates. The derivative was methaqualone, which in the coming years embedded itself as a staple drug in the hippie culture that followed. Methaqualone was fully developed around 1955 as a treatment for insomnia, stress and anxiety, marketed as a safer alternative to barbiturates for overly stressed housewives. But it quickly gained notoriety as a recreational activity in the party and club scene known under names such as quaaludes, lemons, sopors, disco biscuits, and more. This set the stage for it to become a drug of abuse, which many people became addicted to. Its effects as a fast-acting tranquilizer include intense euphoria, muscle relaxing, and anti-anxiety effects, as well as sedation and anesthesia in higher dosages. The FDA approval of methacolone lasted only three years, but like many other medications of that time, did not feature liability assessments of misuse or addiction. Around the 1980s, governments around the world, especially the US and Japan, started cracking down on the sale of many drugs, including barbiturates, amphetamines, over-the-counter opiates, and methacolone. In 1984, at the peak of methacolone's misuse, it got banned entirely, and classed as a Schedule One substance. During the height of its use, it saw a lot of mentions in movies, songs, and pop culture. Songs like David Bowie's Time, movies like Scarface, and more. Over the two decades following, efforts were made to make methacolone analogs without the addictive effects, and they worked really well. For example, the dichloride analog, known as SL-164, developed by Sumitomo Chemical Corporation. It was seen as a prominent replacement, but got scrapped due to toxicity issues. In the same way, nitromethacolone, which is a derivative about 10 times the potency, also got scrapped due to possible carcinogenicity. However, this later got disproven. The only real pharmaceutically approved quinazoline sedative left is afloqualone, which distinguishes itself with a fluoromethyl group and an amine, which is marketed predominantly in Japan. Recently, Quinazoline King sent me this paper from 2020, which investigated 67 new methacolone derivatives, featuring a 2-phenyl substituent instead of the normal methyl. This simple introduction of a 2 aryl substituent was found to lead to a significant increase in GABA modulation. Simply said, an increase of 30 to 40 fold in potency compared to methacolone. Further, introducing a methyl group at the 4 prime para position increased the potency of the molecule another 3 to 4 times, which piqued the interest of the researchers. However, it had one major drawback. Just like other para substituted methacolone analogs like methylmethacolone or SL164, it evokes seizures in medicinal dosages. It is theorized that it is from increased affinity at the AMPA receptor, a receptor that is important for signal transmission between neurons. So these are unfortunately not very useful. Anyway, some analogs further, and the most potent analog they discovered, had a potency of 350 times that of methacolone, which would theoretically correlate to a dosage of only 0.5 milligrams. The receptors PPQ potently acts upon are found in the lobes of the brain, involved with cognition, mood, anxiety modulation, sensory processing, and coordination. Disruption of these balanced systems will probably lead to impairment on these fronts, which is in line with the effects of methacolone itself. The origin of the euphoric effects from methacolone, PPQ and the like, are not clear as of today. There are tens of ways to synthesize quinazolines. However, today, I will be following the paper I mentioned. So to get started, I set up this large Erlenmeyer with a stir bar. 
in a water bath. I add some cooling blocks into it, because the reaction will generate heat, and it's most optimally done cold. Into this, I add 700 ml of the solvent dichloromethane, and let it stir for a while until it's cold. When that happens, the first reagent I add is 55 grams of entronilic acid. After that, I add 58.8 ml of benzoyl chloride as a second reagent. And finally, I slowly add 83.6 ml of the base triethylamine. I measured it out in the same cylinder, so it became a bit cloudy, but it doesn't matter. I first add it in a tiny bit to check the reaction, and then drip it in slowly with a SEP funnel. In this reaction, anthranilic acid reacts with benzoyl chloride in the presence of a base to give the corresponding amide. This typical reaction first proceeds by nucleophilic attack of the amine onto the acid chloride's electron deficient carbonyl carbon forcing a pair of carbonyl double bond electrons onto the oxygen. In the following intermediate, the amine is now charged, and the base triethylamine quickly takes up a proton from the amine, as triethylamine is a significantly stronger base. Then, the electron pair that was forced onto the oxygen now returns to form a double bond and kicks off the chlorine, as it is a good leaving group, which goes on to form triethylamine hydrochloride and giving the final amide product. When the addition of triethylamine was finished, the mixture looks pretty much the same, but after a short while, it turned transparent. To make sure the reaction is finished, I move it out of the ice bath and let it stir at room temperature for 5 hours. When that's done, it looks a bit more cloudy. And now to precipitate out the product, I add a total of 100 ml of concentrated hydrochloric acid. Gradually, we see the product crash out and the stir bar can no longer handle it, so I let it sit like this for an hour to make sure it's complete. After that, I collect all the precipitated product with vacuum filtration. The product is very soggy, and it fills the filter twice. I washed it with water and hexane. I then set it in the oven at 120C for a few hours to dry it out. Still, the texture of this compound is very weird, so I'm not sure if it is completely dry. If I assume it is dry, the yield is 82.8 grams which is 85%, and pretty close to literature. Either way, it won't matter for the next reaction, if there is still some solvent remaining, so I can just forward it like this. For that reaction, I first have to dissolve all the material in some acetic anhydride, of which I add about 400 ml. Acetic anhydride will react with any remaining water to form acetic acid, and the other solvents will boil off from the generated heat. When all of it has dissolved, I move it to this flask in a heating mantle, attach a condenser, and boil this solution for one day. This reaction is a thermal process, for which acetic anhydride is a convenient solvent, as it destroys water that is formed in the reaction. How it proceeds is first through formation of the emitic acid, of which the oxygen can attack the carboxylic acid, forming this cyclic intermediate. Water is quickly eliminated by reforming the carbonyl double bond, and protonation of the hydroxyl, which is then kicked off. In the end, giving this benzo 13 oxazine 4 on. When I return the next day, the mixture looks the same, but the reaction should be finished. I immediately remove the condenser and quickly replace it with a short path distillation apparatus. I then let it cool down a bit and vacuum distill over all the solvent. I pull out the last bit with a stronger vacuum, and what is left behind is a yellowish solid. To clean it up, I add some of the solvent hexane and break it up with a spatula. Then I let it stir overnight to break up the larger pieces and properly allow the solvent to take up the impurities. When that's done, I set it up for vacuum filtration to collect all the solid and wash it with more hexane. I dry it on the filter by pulling a vacuum constantly, which will evaporate remaining hexane. I then pour the powder into a beaker and evident by its weight, it still contains some remaining solvent. Or I have created mass out of nothing. Both are equally plausible. Either way, I can forward it to the next reaction without issue, and I assume the yield is 100% for the calculations. So for the next reaction, I largely dissolve the material in about 600 ml of acetic acid. I then add the only required reagent, which is 32.6 ml of aniline. Pure aniline is clear, but after some time and air exposure, it discolors easily, even though this bottle was unopened. I move this mixture to a flask in a heating mantle, and wash out the beaker with more acetic acid. I also add more acetic acid to a total of about 700 ml. I then attach a condenser and boil this mixture for a day. In this reaction, the benzoxazinone 
reacts with aniline to form PPQ. Acetic acid is just a solvent, but will also aid in protonation and deprotonation, which will accelerate the reaction. How it proceeds is first through nucleophilic attack of the amine from aniline onto the carbonyl carbon of the oxyzenone. This intermediate undergoes a proton transfer, giving this short-lasting amino alcohol, as a free electron pair from the oxygen moves to form a double bond and forces the other carbon-oxygen bond electrons onto the oxygen, causing it to ring open. Another proton transfer balances the charges, giving an intermediate with an amide and amidic acid. Amidic acids will largely favor tautomerization to an amide, so the next reaction here is slow, which is why it takes a day. In a concerted step, the amidic acid nitrogen deprotonates the amide. The amide attacks the carbon of the amidic acid, and a pair of double bond electrons moves onto the amidic acid nitrogen, resulting in the cyclized intermediate that also has an amino alcohol that quickly eliminates water to form the final quinazolinone, called PPQ. When I return the next day, the mixture has turned more yellow, and the reaction should be finished. So like earlier, I swap the condenser for a short path distillation apparatus, and I distill off all the solvent, and the last bits I pull out on a strong vacuum. When that's finished, I partition the remaining liquid between water and dichloromethane. I just let that stir strongly for a while, so that the product dissolves in the DCM and other trash goes into the water layer. I take the mixture and bring it to the separatory funnel to separate the layers, and I discard the upper water layer. I take the lower DCM layer and absorb remaining droplets of water with sodium sulfide. I mix that around and then filter it all through some cotton, directly into a flask to remove the wet sodium sulfate. I wash it out and down with some fresh DCM and then set it up for distillation to remove all of the DCM again. Quickly, the product already starts to precipitate out, but I still removed all of the DCM. I am then left with a wet brownish slurry. Since I noticed it isn't very soluble in DCM, I can use that to clean it up, since the impurities are a lot more soluble. So I first add a large amount of fresh DCM and boil the solution. A large part of the product will still not dissolve and I can easily filter it out. So I set it up for vacuum filtration, leaving behind a white solid that I wash with more DCM. The liquid filtrate still contains product, from which I can recover most. But first I take the product and move it into a beaker, giving the first bit of relatively pure product. Now to get out the rest, I put the liquid filtrate in the freezer at minus 30 C, which caused pretty much all of the product to crystallize out. So I filter that through the same filter, but as we can see, it's still quite yellow. So I will wash it with more DCM and break up the solid until the filtrate runs clear and the solid is white. I combine both the yields, but I want to make sure that it is really clean. So I will recrystallize it all from toluene. To do that, I saturate a boiling solution of toluene with the product. If not everything has dissolved, I can be sure that it is saturated. So when only a little bit of solid remains suspended, I filter it to remove the solid and get a saturated solution of PPQ in hot toluene. What remains on the filter is just a tiny amount, and I will discard it. The liquid filtered I put in the freezer at minus 30 C to crystallize out the PPQ. It worked, and I transferred it to a beaker because I want to use this flask for the filtration. I then set it up for vacuum filtration to collect all the solid. To remove the toluene, which is a lot more annoying to evaporate, I wash it with DCM, which will carry it away. I let it dry on the filter for a while, and then move it all to a beaker, giving a pure yield of 13.5 grams of PPQ, which is about 17%, and honestly that is expected, since the yield for the last step is always kinda bad, and I did extra purification. Anyhow, that was it, time to dissociate, see ya.